Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. What's up? Today is our part two conversation with Chuck Gerard. He was the one who helped pioneer contemporary Christian music. And if you haven't seen part one, you can go in the description below and check that out. Thanks so much. And now here's our part two with Chuck Gerard. I want to say this. If you, I don't know, Chuck, if you're hip, hip on this, but I'd really like to talk about, because uh, I kind of say, I don't know if you could relate this, but at least the Calvaries in this area are pretty uh, Bapticostal, you know, more Baptist than, you know, it's like we talk about the gifts, but we don't walk in them. And I'm saying I have a hat that says old school Calvary, you know, like the Lonnie Frisbee kind of, and I, I went to Grace Chapel, which like Chuck said, was the second Calvary Chapel. Um, and so I went there as a Baptist to disprove tongues and mm -hmm. to say this isn't for today because I went to a Baptist Bible college. They said it's demonic or made up. So I went there because this girl was going that I was dating was going there. And I said, I can't have a tongue talking woman. And um, but God touched me and rocked my world. Well, we kind of got into uh, we were very much into uh, the vineyard movement. And I and John Wimber came and spoke a couple of times. And I heard you are kind of a part of that. So I'd really like to, I mean, if you feel free, you know, I want to say kind of like I heard you say, I don't know how you heard it. I forget the words you used, but where you said you were kind of like a, like would say when you said Ken Gullickson said, don't, don't listen to Kenneth Copeland. You would go check out Kenneth Copeland. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, but I would like to talk about how like the vineyard, like it seemed like from what little I know, because I came into Calvary and like I became a Calvary pastor in about 01. So it's been, you know, not that I missed a lot of all the stuff, but I remember it was kind of like where Chuck's famous words, you know, to the vineyard people, don't leave angry, just leave, you know, and kind of where's that balance of where the, what I understood was Chuck was saying, we don't want to move as much in the gifts as the vineyard wants. And I'm thinking, of course, there's a, I agree with Chuck where teaching the words with signs and wonders following, we shouldn't chase after signs. But I really believe, I don't, and I would like to ask you, but that was mm -hmm. instrumental, right? I mean, the Lonnie was a huge part of two major movements, mm -hmm. even though he had his issues. But mm -hmm. still, it was the power of the Spirit to train. Like I was, you know, you know, you probably <laughs> more radical than me, but I mean, I was a drug dealer, you know, a thug, a kind of a biker hippie, and I got saved overnight and quit everything mm -hmm. instantly. You know, and like you, I struggle with alcohol still a little bit, but everything else, drugs gone, womanizing mm -hmm. pretty much gone. And, and so people were saved yep, just pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But people saw the change and were saved just from that. And I definitely believe it was a move of God and where mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I like to see that happening more again in America. Cause it seems like now you're on a 25 year, try to get off drugs. And I'm like, uh, you know, I mean, not that God doesn't take time sometimes, but it's you just don't see the Saul, you know, or Saul to Paul very much as, mm -hmm. as much as you like. Yeah. So I like to talk about that if you're willing to talk about that and kind of unpack that whole, um, you know, the okay. gifts done decently in order and just to talk right. about like where and I because I liked what you said where I believe in the faith movement. I'm not into Cadillacs and Learjets, <laughs> but I'm open. And that's where I'm at, where mm -hmm. it's like I've seen God move. I think I agree, you know, I don't know if you saw the the movie about Lonnie Hippie Preacher or whatever it is, you know, but where they kind of inferred like, oh, you know, Chuck and all these people used him and they didn't acknowledge the gift and how it's kind of homosexual. But like the thing I want to say is, but yet this guy, the, he was he was a little crazy, some people said who knew him, but yet he was used powerfully and how I'd really like to, my heart is to see that brought back, you know, where we have yeah. the teaching of the word but with a real Signs pure, uh, decently in order move of God where, you know, there really right. is that. So Amen. is that kind of where you're well, at? Or? As you say, unpack that for you. Um, when we got there, it was 19, February of 1971, first time we played there. Okay. And, um, of course, we were attracted to Lonnie because he was a hippie preacher. And Chuck was always the, you know, the reason that I believe God picked Chuck was because he was such an anchor uh, I've actually said this to Chuck uh, to his face. I said, Chuck, you're the most open-minded, closed-minded man I've ever met. <laughs> when it came to doctrine, he was very narrow. Very, I mean, he, when we started playing around with, uh, not playing around, but uh, going around with uh, Bob Mumford, he was not into it. Yeah. I don't know if you remember Bob, but yeah, yeah. Bob Mumford was a little more charismatic and all that. And uh, so... Chuck was sort of the anchor and just just God's man for that time because he was not a 
fish shaking, finger pointing preacher. He was just a, a guy who wore casual clothes. The only time there was a formal service at Calvary was Sunday morning, and they did pull up. You know, they did the organ, and Chuck wore a suit. But all the rest of the meetings were all casual, and he talked as if Famous he was sweatshirt. having a conversation with you. Yeah. But he was also uh, the open-minded part was that that he was able to see that there was something going on where he needed to let this bunch of hippies, you know, he, his wife Kay got interested in the hippies. Then they met Lonnie, they met one, and they had Lonnie live in their home for a while. So they got to know that culture through Lonnie. Then they invited him to come and have a Bible study. So the stuff happened, the charismatic stuff, I'd call it, or the move of the spirit stuff happened in the afterglows, mainly by Lonnie. I saw an actual exorcism from the platform by Lonnie at Calvary, which would never even come close in a service where Chuck was in charge. Yeah. And um, that kind of stuff happened in the afterglow. So Lonnie was the one that brought the Holy Spirit m more readily into the public part of the congregation. And Chuck was always, a, I always personally considered him to be a little bit like an overprotective parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, get your shoes yeah. muddy, you know, go, don't go out and play with the other boys because you'll get your suit dirty or whatever. A little bit to a fault, hmm. but yet that balance between Lonnie at that time, it was a perfect storm because, you know, Lonnie was just totally like whatever God wanted him to do. I'll tell you a quick Lonnie story, and then uh, I'm sure it's in my book, but uh, uh, we were just, we were, we were just wide-eyed hippies, and we idolized Lonnie in the best way. It wasn't that we thought he was better than Chuck or, you know, he was, but he was just so powerful. So we hung out with him a lot, and one day Fred and I are driving around. He had a Lonnie had a Lincoln Continental, and he was really embarrassed about it <laughs> because someone gave it to him, but it was a really upscale car. So he had a little bumper sticker on the back that said "God provides," because that's really what. Happened. So we're driving around in that Lincoln one day, and he says, "Pull in here," and he, and he points to this uh, uh, apartment complex, and he says, "Get your guitars and follow me." So it's just Fred and I, who was one of our, he was our first guitarist. So we follow Lonnie up to the uh, to apartment 14, I'll make it up, I don't know what it was, second floor. We knock on the door, and the door opens, and marijuana smoke pours out, and there's about 10 hippies in there, and they're looking at us like deer in the headlight, like they're hallucinating us, and Lonnie comes in, and he just, he doesn't say, I'm Lonnie, he doesn't say, he says, we are servants of the Most High God, and we're here to preach you the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, but first, Love Song is going to sing, Think About What Jesus Said. Well, that was one of our songs, uh, the chorus was, Think About What Jesus Says, uh, Before You Let Your Mind Reject Him, Listen to Your Heart Instead, and You Will Accept Him. Well, we weren't Love Song, we were just Chuck and Fred, and we had one guitar, but Fred played the guitar, and we both sang the song. And then Lonnie preached for about 10 minutes, maybe less. It's a long time ago. Uh, and gave an altar call, and two guys raised their hand. Yeah. Well, I saw those guys at Calvary over the years. All They were very faithful. They came to church all the time. But I never really talked to them. So one day I went down there. It was a, this was quite a few years later, 25 years later. And after the service, this guy comes up to me, who was one of the guys in the room, and he said, how did you guys know we were in there? You know, we've always wondered that, how you ever got to knock on our door. And I said, well, I always just figured Lonnie knew somebody up there. And he said, no, we never laid eyes on you guys before in our lives. Why they, You know, in, 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 the, in the new days, they wouldn't even open the door because it might be the cops. But, yeah. you know, yeah. we were trusting hippies. So uh, it led me to believe Lonnie was already passed by this time. So I couldn't, I never got a chance to ask him, but my supposition and i think correctly so is that he just heard the lord say go up to apartment 14 and i'll tell you what to do from there and that was just how long he was and he did that in the afterglow meetings and then um chuck would you know brought the balance and uh it was just a perfect combination of everything and then because of chuck's open-mindedness to let like uh, young long hair kids get up and share their music eventually a band with drums. These were unheard of things in those days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that wasn't a, a common thing at all. Nowadays, you're uncool if you don't have drums and bass in the yeah. church. Yeah. But in those days, it was like a real radical thing. So he was open-minded to see that God was doing something with the culture through the hippie thing and uh, let it breathe. And uh, we had some we had some misfires. He, he'd shut down some concerts once in a while if he didn't like the group or the group was too loud or whatever, you know. He had those kind of um, considerations in mind. But by and large, he, he was smart enough to know that 
he should let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And uh, my wife, Karen, I agree with her totally, but she's always reminding me, when you get in an interview, you tell people that was not anything that was designed by man. Mm-hmm. That was God all the way. Yeah. And, you know, when we started playing, and I'm not saying it was because our band played, but when, when we started to play is when it really opened up. They were running about 200 in that little, the first little chapel. And within four months after we started playing, we became the house band for a little while. Uh, there was a couple of groups already there, Children of the Day and a group called the Joy Band. But we were kind of the, we were the ones that were sort of leading the pack. We were sort of the house band. And uh, when the thing broke loose, it grew from about 200 to 2,000 yeah. Yeah. in about four months' time. Well, they couldn't accommodate. You know, we could accommodate crowds for, to a certain degree because they had glass walls. So they'd put speakers outside and put overflow chairs out there. But we were outgrowing everything very quickly. So Chuck put up the circus tent that was there for a couple of years. And uh, we had meetings in there to accommodate the crowds. There was phenomenal church growth that you could not plan with a program. Yeah, exactly. In fact, Chuck told me, he said, these guys would come into my office. And, you know, the, the ones that scoffed earlier. Oh, that's the hippie church down yeah, in Costa yeah. Mesa. Just, just, and then after the big, you know, um, uh, explosion... They'd come in and say, oh, well, Chuck, what's the program here? Yeah. And he'd yeah. just say, ah, oh, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it was. It was all a work of God. You know, you couldn't sit in a back room and plan it. We didn't come in and think, well, how can we relate to these kids? You know, maybe if we played guitars and drums, we were that. Yeah. So yeah. when we came in, we just had this music we were writing that would be the same music we'd be writing if we were not Christians. But now we had our Christian uh, conversion and our Christian message to, to put into our lyrics. And that was the big attraction. And I think part of the reason the music was so important, because w- when the music played, that was a, a big lure to the hippies. The hippie preacher that looked at Jesus and a band that looked like Crosby, Stills & Nash or Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. And word got out. And, you know, Tommy Coombs wrote one of our great songs, Two Hands, and it has the line, with one hand, reach out to Jesus, and with the other, bring a friend. And that's exactly what happened. The, the, the hippies were telling their friends, you know, you got to come here. This is really cool. And uh, for a while, I wondered about the cool factor because, you know, the Bible says if you're really doing it right, you'll be rejected. But it was a very popular thing. People were, you know, like my song says, people come in every day for miles around for meetings and for Sunday school. People would drive. They drive from other states just yeah. to go to Catholic yeah. Chapel. Um, <laughs> the the question I have for you, and this is what I really want to ask, because this is really where I'm at right now as a Calvary pastor, because our, you know, like in California, there seems to be some pockets from what I see that people like, um, oh, I can't remember his name up in Santa Barbara. Ryan, Ricky Ryan. Ricky Ryan, Ricky Ryan, yeah, Ricky that was Ryan. it. And he's like, you know, he's like, you know, he's just speaking in tugs, and he made sounds like he prayed for me. He goes, Lord bless him. I'm like, what is the? It's kind of, so I mean, I'm going, wow, this guy's like not normal Calvary. I mean, this guy's pretty radical. So there seems to be those pockets of Calvary people that still were pretty radical and and wanted to move the spirit. But in my area, without dogging any names, it seems like we're more Baptocostal, where we talk about the Holy Spirit, but we're not going to let him loose because he's a little crazy. And, right. and so um, what what say you, since you've been there, done that, and you've seen the beginning of this movement almost to the, you know, now we're 50 years, right? So how do we, I love Rawl, you know, in the argument of like the kind of the division of Calvary now, the two different camps, you know, the Bride and mm-hmm. Brothers and the old school, and where mm-hmm. people say, I like what Raul Reese said, we don't need a new paradigm. We just need a fresh move of the spirit, you know? And <laughs> so right. it's like, I think you agree with that. I don't think you really need a huge paradigm shift, but we just need to welcome what started Calvary. Like you said, your wife said, it was a, just an outpouring of the Holy mm-hmm. Spirit. But I was just reading a book today saying we're, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, earnestly, you know, pursue love, earnestly desire the gifts, especially my prophecy. So we have to earnestly seek it. It doesn't, you know, I mean, we got to be open to it. It's not very rarely does it just pour, pour it out. I mean, Chuck knew of the gifts. Lonnie was probably at times, maybe I heard from people on the hippie preacher went almost too far at times where they said he's a little nutty, but there's that, there was that desire for it done decently in order. So what would you say, Chuck, to how do we get back to that, you know, where we can have new wine and kind of, you know, with our old paradigm, but but bring back that kind of hippie, a little bit of liberty to get back to the real move of God again. 
Are you talking about Calvary specifically right now? I'm talking about any, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, Calvary, but also I think any church, but just how we can, because I think Calvary, right, a lot of people came to Calvary Chapel, how did you do it? How did you do it? And the answer, I remember asking Chuck, and he just says, oh, just the Holy Spirit. And then mm-hmm. all I could get from Chuck, I don't know if you ever asked him this or heard him say this, but he said the only key, or whatever you want to call it, that he would say is he would go with Kay to Huntington Beach and they'd pray for the hippies and he'd always say, if you bind the strong man, it's easy to take the strong man's spoils. You hear him say that? So he'd just say, that's all I got from him is just pray, intercede, bind the strong man, and they just ask God just to open the hippies' eyes, deliver them from drugs, and that was kind of, and he said, as you know, as you said in your interview with your daughter, that Chuck's thing was get take a bath, you lazy hippie, get a job and take a bath. But <laughs> Kay gave that heart to really pray, and then Chuck later, as he said, got that heart. But but what do you think is missing from Calvary's or the church in America in general? Because it seems like we have kind of either baptism or charismaniac, mm-hmm. but we very rarely have that balance of spirit and truth. So what would you say since you've seen the full gamut? Re- resurrect Chuck Smith. No, uh, <laughs> uh, Lottie, probably no. Lottie, right? Lottie and Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But here's the deal, I think. Uh, a lot of it is because looking not specifically at the Calvary stream, because they were always a little bit like that, under, even under Chuck. You know, we acknowledge all the gifts, but we're not really going to let them flow in the service. Mm. Uh, but a lot of it today, to me, as I observe, and, you know, obviously every church in the world or anything, but it, it's gone so professional you know, the worship team sound like a, a rock concert, and the, the teaching often is more, you know, um, you, don't pre- you don't hear a lot of preaching on spiritual warfare or sin or the blood of Jesus. It's more like a self-improvement type of message, and that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's guys like Joel Osteen, and, and, and Joel, you know, I'm not using him as an example. He's preaching, in my opinion, a partial gospel because it's all the good stuff. You, yep. know, you can have this and you can have that and you can have success, but you need to also tell them, but you're going to pay the price and yeah. pick up your cross and follow him. So I think there's that camp that has gone into that uh, area of just more, and also uh, what they used to call seeker sensitive. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we want to uh, make this so comfortable for the sinner that he'll stay. Yeah. Well, that was never Chuck's deal. Chuck was just preached the straight gospel, and if you get saved, you get saved. But, you know, I've been in some radical uh, secret sensitive places. I had one place where they told me not to, not to say blood, mm. not talk about the blood of Jesus. We don't call it the church. We call it the family. And I had to learn a whole new, uh, just to do a concert, I had to learn a whole new uh, language. Mm. So there's that side of it. And then um, there's the other side that, you know, like, where people are just so off the rails that it's overdone. But I don't think that you can, I don't think there's a formula for mm-hmm. bringing it back. It's just up to the individual. You know, you, you go to a church because you're attracted to its format. You like the music, you like the preacher, whatever. And um, I, I feel like, you know, maybe this will help explain it. Um, people are always asking me, and now there's a lot of people trying to create a new Jesus movement. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I always say that um, you can't create that. You know, it, it's just got to be something God does. And you can't do it by devices or by, by having a great band. It's all about the anointing. It's all about the flow of the Holy Spirit. So my answer is that the kingdom, because people say, will we have another Jesus movement? And I believe we never will by the same way that we had the 70s one. Yeah. Because here's, here's why, and it's in my book. Uh, the, uh, at that time, it's maybe a unique thing in the whole history of the world is that, is that the, 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 the world at large was driven by one subculture, the hippies. Now, there were others, but that was the main one, mm-hmm. largely fueled by the music, the pop music of the Beatles and Bob Dylan, who came out and said, hey, we're dropping LSD and mm-hmm. we're going, hey, they're on our trip. Yeah. So that all lasted through the 60s. Then at the end of the 60s, I know for me, I'm standing at the brink of disillusionment in 1969, and everybody failed me. Timothy Leary failed me. Eastern philosophies failed me. And then I go like, where do we go from here? And then we started to hear about Calvary Chapel. 
So it was low hanging fruit in a lot of ways that made it such a, a huge, by the way, it was only really huge in the United States. Canada had kind of a version of it and it did get into Europe a little bit, but it was largely an American phenomena. And um, so, so it was like the next step. We heard about Calvary Chapel. We went there, we heard about Jesus and we surrendered our lives and of course then began to play. So in today's climate, we don't have that. You have a lot of different subcultures of, of counterculture. You have goths and you have skinheads and you have all this different stuff. So I don't think it can happen the same way. And then I go back to my statement, the kingdom of heaven comes without observation. So I believe we will have a move. I don't see a great revival in the Bible, but I'm not saying we won't have one at the end times. But I think it'll be something, it won't make the front page of the New York Times. It'll just be something that God does. And of course, here's another aspect. We see everything through our American lens. You know, we are the most uh, cloistered nation in the whole world. You, you can go to any nation in the world and ask them what the U.S. dollar is worth, and they'll know. But you ask any American, what's the Canadian dollar today? They're not going to know. Because we just look at things through our own little prism of what's happening in America. Because all this is happening in other countries. Do you believe as a Calvary guy, or I don't know if you still call you, but do you believe, because yeah, this, this is a big thing where I get shredded, is for believing you can go under the power of saying the spirit, whatever you want to call it, that that's a big no-no, at least in my area. And then also a huge thing, and if you've done drugs, I came to Christ, I had a lot of oppression, not yeah. possession, but oppress, mm -hmm. yeah. because I would see faces, I'd hear voices. Yeah. And so this guy, I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Tom White, he wrote a, a book called mm -hmm. Guide to Spiritual Warfare, but he um, was a Baptist like me in my church in Oregon, Corvallis, and he got... Uh, saw he was he had been in witchcraft and all that stuff mm -hmm. so he's seeing faces well then he realized wait a second i have authority over this in christ i don't have yeah. to take this and then he started doing deliverance but here's the key right even calvary would have a problem but he he would pray for christians that had oppression especially people like me had gone through the lsd yes. as you know pharmacia the uh, a sorcery of pharmacia opens where it opens door. you i believe mm -hmm. to a lot of so I'm I'm just thinking I'm I'm having flashbacks I'm schizophrenic and then all of a sudden this crazy guy is now he's in a barn out in the middle of nowhere or something and I might go into a cult mm -hmm. and this guy says what do you have to lose he prays for me and I'm totally set free I've been yep. saved two years mm -hmm. so I'm going and I and I tell Calvary pastor and they go well you it was probably a power suggestion I go mm -hmm. I was a Baptist I didn't believe in this stuff I just went because I was seeing faces demons looking at me hearing voices and he prayed for me and gone yeah. and so yeah. once I was blind but not so I said guys you can tell me whatever you want. But I was there. I saw it. I sure. felt the experience. I, I, I'm a total. I wouldn't probably be here today if I hadn't had if God hadn't used that person to set me free from demonic oppression, not possession, yeah, but oppression. So yeah. you, you kind of, you, you're, you're cool with that. I, mean, I went through. I had, I had a lot of darkness on me and heaviness in my first year or two, maybe more, as a Christian. Yeah. It's kind of what got me back into alcohol. Yep. You know? Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you said that. Yeah. I thought about that because the sad thing with Chuck is he just thought, you know, and he does the, what, First Corinthians 5.18, those who are Christians will not make a practice of sinning and the enemy cannot touch them. Well, okay, but how many of us still had the practice of yeah. sinning because we had <laughs> yeah. addictions? Mm -hmm. We had all kinds of, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think, you know, it's like one person said, get rid of the trash, the rats will leave. But a lot of us still had those habits of trash, right, of, of drink. Like for me, I gave up drugs, but alcohol yeah. was my go-to if I was ever depressed or discouraged. I would just kind of closet drink as a Christian, and you couldn't tell anyone, of course, as a Baptist mm -hmm. especially. But I had that struggle. Well, I believe a lot of that was – the, yeah. the demonic stuff and so once i was set free i really didn't i mean yeah i could struggle with alcohol again but i just don't have the desire like i did i mean it to me it was like it was like the holy spirit i had to have it whenever i was in mm -hmm. trouble you know what i mean it was my go-to so so yeah. what was it like for you because you said you had struggle with alcohol in christ and i think you had said before it was like two times um what did that look like and i think another time you had also said like no one had to tell you you're a sinner even mm. before Christ, like mm -hmm. you knew. So what was that feeling when you were, you know, doing concerts and with Love Song, but like struggling with, with alcohol and stuff like that? Like, how did that come out or what did that look like for you? Well, it'd be what you would imagine. I felt very hypocritical. I felt very powerless. I didn't, um, I didn't have, you know, you read in the Bible of man of God has self-control and I knew I didn't. 
I opened the door quite casually. It took a while. Uh, like I say, I had this kind of mantle of a depression on me. I couldn't understand it. Uh, I was born again. I was delivered from drugs as far as I could tell. I mean, I, I didn't take other drugs from that point on. But uh, eventually, I, what I what I call it is that I found what I call the loophole scriptures, which are the take a little wine for your stomach's infirmity, Jesus turned the water into wine. So I, I deduced mm. that uh, I could drink if I didn't get drunk. Mm. So that started the, the nine-year development of this thing. And uh, I, I don't know how, I forget how deeply I explored. We, we went through a lot of introspection, my wife and I, about our examination about that segment of the book because we didn't want to stumble people. Mm. You know, you can make a testimony sound pretty interesting yeah, sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, but I, uh, it took a long time. You know, I, I started just drinking wine and then uh, I wanted more buzz. And so here's how an alcoholic thinks. Brandy is made out of grapes, so it's <laughs> just strong wine. So I'll switch to brandy. I won't have to drink so much to get the buzz. Yeah. And Same then eventually the, to vodka because you, supposedly it's not as detectable on your breath. It's not really true. But So anyhow, by the end of that nine years, I was in a really dark place, really dark, mm. and feeling very hypocritical and feeling uh, mad at God. Why don't you deliver me? I'm trying here. You know, you always get up. You start the day thinking I'm going to have a good day today, and then by noon it's over. You know, I'm going to go. Oh, I'm going to go get a bottle. And that was my life for the last few years until, you know, the Lord delivered me. And how that happened was um, my wife and I, she, she, I put her through some real hell. Mm. And uh, she pretty much had it. Mm. So she, she, she set up an intervention with Chuck Smith. And actually Ken was in on it too, down at Chuck's office. And they, they decided that I, they said, we've decided in advance. That's how an intervention works. You decide the plan of action because what happens the uh, subject is often very, very uh, uh, convincing. Mm. I remember I almost turned it when I said, you know, they said, you need to go into a hospital. I said, well, Chuck, couldn't I just go up to the Bible camp and mm. you know, get under the word? And he almost bought it. Mm. And then he said, no, no, you have to go to the hospital. So I went through a program. I went through a year of not drinking that was really dark because now I didn't have my crutch. Mm. And then um, my wife went to see him. Uh, fellow that you might know who he is. His name is uh, Henry Catrona. Mm. He was in one of the early Jesus groups. Um, I forget which one with Daryl Mansfield. Oh, I remember I Daryl Mansfield. I don't remember. I don't remember the other guy. Then. So Henry worked for my wife's cousin in a T-shirt factory, and she went in to see her cousin. She hadn't seen her cousin in years, and um, I've already gone through the hospital now, but I'm really not having a good time of it in life, and um, so she's. My wife also doesn't really like to uncover me, so she'll hardly ever talk. You know, Chuck's not doing well. She won't do that. And in a way, that's sort of an enabler in a way. So there's a bad and a good side to that. But it comes out of integrity and uh, her integrity. And so uh, she just got candid. Uh, Henry said, how is everything, Karen? She's not good. You know, Chuck's this, that, that, and the other thing. And, she, he, and he was beginning, he was going to go start a church that he did eventually start. He was leaving. That was his last day. And he said, uh, I'm going to go start a church called The uh, Hiding Place. Mm. And uh, that's the church where uh, Carrie Fisher's brother, Todd, was a co-pastor. And there was some, a lot of celebrity stuff going on in that church. And Henry said, well, you know, I was going to AA and all that. And Henry said, he was in the faith thing. And he said that, well, you know, Chuck Chuck will come to a place where he won't need AA and he won't have to confess he's an alcoholic. God's going to deliver Chuck. And then surely enough, a couple of months later, uh, a situation happened between my wife and I. She became brutally honest with me about her feelings for me, basically almost telling me it would be better for me if you died, but I'm, wow. I'm going to stick with you. So it just crushed me. And I, I had to go to Canada. Um, I didn't know how I'd you know, I was so crushed. I thought, I can't go to Canada. I have to stay here and win my wife back. Mm. But I did go to Canada, and uh, I had a, this catharsis, a kind of an inner healing in a hotel room, and I got delivered. For, it was a deliverance, really, a year after I stopped drinking, because at that point, I was right back with God. It was a little bit like, you know, we jokingly say I was born again again. Mm -hmm felt like that to me, and uh, this darkness lifted off of me, and a new season in my life started, 
And I, I started writing this, these prophetic songs that became the album Name Above All Names, which I'd never done before. Mm. I was, I've never been considered myself to be a prophet or anything. I, I feel I have some prophetic gifts in operation at times, but, you know, it doesn't make you a prophet. So um, it's, it changed my ministry. It changed my life. And that was the first episode. Then I went for over 15 years without drinking, touching a drop of alcohol. Mm. <clears throat> we met these friends. We went over to this event in Europe uh, put on by some military people. We met these folks, and, and they kept bringing me back because they wanted to bring U.S. ministry into Germany. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'd go back, and in those German restaurants, you know, yeah, they right drink right. alcohol like, yeah, like water. Like <laughs> so I thought, you know, I've been healed and delivered. I can drink yeah. like normal people, yeah. and I, I just deceived myself into it. And you know, they they we'd finish a meal. They bring a, after you in in Europe, well, in Germany, you finish a meal. They bring a little liqueur. Mm. You don't even order it. It's like a after thought. You know, it's like a, bringing you a free the chips yeah, yeah. Yeah. at the Mexican restaurant. Right? So they didn't drink. So they'd leave their thing on the table, their little aperitif, and and I'd I'd say, oh, I, dro- I left my glasses <laughs> on the table, and I go back and I drink their. Should have been the first sign, yeah, right? And I'm still doing it in secret, and yeah, it's it's not an open thing. Well, that was a much shorter period of time, about two years. The first time was a big year ordeal. The second time, I uh, I'd gone on for about two years, and I saw I was back in the in the like the the, the dog returns to his yeah. vomit. And I looked in the mirror one day, and I've never had a vision vision. I've had sort of perceptions and things that were spiritual, but I'm just not that guy. But I looked in the mirror, and I didn't see me this way, but I perceived me this way. I saw a dead man, Mm -hmm. and I felt like, if you keep this up, you're not going to live for six more months. I don't know if the Lord told me that or if I told myself. I don't know what – well, I do know what happened, but it just – I put down. I stopped drinking. That was the end of 1999, and now it's 2021, so it's 21 years this time with that lapse in the middle. But I, the reason I included that in the book, because my wife said, oh, they're going to be all excited that you got delivered, and then you went back to it. And I said, but, but you know, here's the difference. The first time, I quit because everybody else wanted yeah. me to, and I didn't yeah. want to bring the to God. But I wanted to drink. Yeah. Still did. Yeah. I didn't I didn't walk around wanting to drink all the time. I was delivered in that sense. But if I had the opportunity, I would have. Second time, you. I said, I need to do this for me. And I'd, I'd say, God, that kind of cheapens it. You no, know, it doesn't. You do it for you. It, does, it, does, it benefits everybody. And I wanted it that time. And that's when the nail went in the coffin. Mm-hmm. And, and I, today, I, I, I can't even say that I, I'm tempted to, you know, to drink. I'm around alcohol and people that drink all the time. They'll say, oh, do you mind if I have a glass of wine? Oh, no. You know. So it's a, it, but yet, there's that little extra thing that we don't know biblically. Be careful when you think you stand, lest you fall. So I yeah. never think that I shouldn't be on guard. Amen. That's good. But 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 I but I feel like I'll never drink again as long as I'm there. Yeah. I know, and I love that you say that because that's my dad. Like his story, like in Christ, he would struggle with alcohol, and it was one time where I think my little brother was really young, mm. and he just got back because he worked at a ho- the hotel. And they would just give like free alcohol and stuff because he worked there. Mm-hmm. And so he came home like kind of buzzed. And I think Morgan like hit him, you know, in the, in the, <laughs> in the parts. <laughs> so he got mad and he got mad at Morgan. And so my mom saw that and she said, this stops today. No more. And then after that, it's like the wives, they really bring that fear of God like in you to. But then so how my dad always teaches us is like we understand that drinking like like you have that right like in the verse that we i kind of look at it too and we say like all things are lawful but not all things are profitable Mm -hmm. like so as like for leadership we say like we encourage them to give the right to lay it down like it is a right but just to lay it down because my dad's family they were all alcoholics and like and so i myself could think like oh i wouldn't be fine i'd be fine i don't have an addictive personality but again like you said you have to be careful where you think you're strong. Like, oh, I would never be like my dad or the family. But also mm-hmm. even the example, like what I, people don't agree with us when we say this, but it's true. Like, cause I, with my brother, we lead the work, the youth group and stuff. And we've heard so many stories of people in Calvary, like youth pastors and stuff. They see them drinking at a bar or something or just like, and they're like, oh, it's just one glass of wine. But a kid sees that. And what you do in moderation, they usually do in excess. So 
it's just something that yeah, I think a lot of people think and they're like, oh, that's legalistic. But we're like, we're not judging you for doing that. But for us, we just know the weakness and we we know how <laughs> wretched we are and how easily we could slip, especially when you're in a form of leadership. And the Bible talks about, yeah. you know, kings not giving into strong, strong drink. drink or strong drink. So, you know, it's funny about it's, this, Chuck. You'll love this. I went on a Calvary cruise and I would say with who, but. Every Calvary pastor was drinking. They had bottles. And big bottles, like three bottles on the truth. Mm. And I'm just going. Calvary guy? Yeah. And I'm yeah. going, guy, oh. I guess when the cat's away, you know, Chuck died, I guess the cat's like, away. Like these are the I'm head going, guys. I'm, and I can say names that you would know huge. And I was like, we'll say it after. are you kidding? Yeah, I'll tell you, no. But I'm I sorry. was just like, and it's kind of stumbled me because yeah. I'm going, man, maybe I, you know, and you don't realize how much, you know, as an alcohol, how you leverage will. Well, so and so drinks, yeah. you know, and it's like I just go, I don't want to be that stumbling block, even yeah. though I have the right to drink, right. and even though I think I might have the, you know, I might have the control to drink. I just because people will leverage, and I have a oh, story yeah. anyway, I, I, yeah, but, but a story of where one Calvary el- elder, you know, because the Calvary here, one of the Calvaries here says they ask you to give up the right as an elder to get drink. I think Chuck did that mm-hmm. too. Well, this one elder snuck it, drank. This guy just came out of rehab for alcohol, sees him drinking. He says, man, if he can drink, why can't I have a drink? He drinks, gets crazy, goes through a railroad crossing with his whole family, almost gets hit by a train, and then he te- and then he gets caught. And then they say, well, I saw so-and-so drinking, and I just go, I don't want to be that so-and-so that people leverage to drink because, uh-huh. you know what I mean? And like you, I have a dick. I won't say I'm an alcoholic anymore, but I know if I drink a beer, or a, I want to drink. Five of them. I don't want to drink. I can't drink. Yeah, oh, I just too. have one glass of wine or one beer. It's like yeah. I'm doing a six. And I wish there was a meter, right? I would drink if I had a meter on my arm that would say, "Up, oh, two, stop now." But you know, by the time you realize it, you're like, oh, "I love you, Chuck. You're the best." You know, and then you're kind of yeah, out of it, right? So yeah. But anyway, I just let it go. But. Well, if it's any comfort to you guys, I'm right on your page with that. I believe that there's a higher calling to yeah. a leader, and we should be that example. And it's not legalism; it's just yeah. a choice you make. I think it's love, it's like you, you say, it. you don't like you say, uh, Mariah, you don't have an addictive personality. But now we have beer and hymns events. Oh yeah, let's oh, have a, we're Psalms have a beer and suds. They oh, call it beer. Psalms and suds. Yeah. We just went to a real big guy who's big on the internet and. Uh, they were talking about having psalms and suds, and I'm going, really? Is that what we're promoting at church now? Like, we, we don't have enough problems yeah. where we're going to encourage people to go to a bar, drink a couple pints, and talk about the psalms. I'm like, mm. uh, I see some problems. I, I guess I my old Catholic legalistic ways are coming up because I'm just going, that's a no, little too, that's a little too hook, yeah, hip, sense. you know? So, yeah. 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 But we also wanted to for you to share a little bit because we um, just, you have, like, you did a great job, obviously, raising your your children, because Elise says she talks super highly Same of mom. you. And I, and that's what I love. It's just, it's honestly like, you just have to be open communication with your kids as a parent, and you have to be humble and honest. And I think that's all kids are really looking for, is just to be, my parents, they're really real with their past and what they went through. And and then you see that when Elisa talks about you, which I grew up loving Zoe Girl, and so I knew all about Elisa and all that stuff. So it's just cool now to know like you're her yeah, dad yeah. and what you went through. It's a lot like my dad. Yeah. And so what was that like growing up? What are some advice you would give to parents who maybe still struggle with stuff or that, or they have a past, but now they're wanting to say like, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Mm. But just mm-hmm. some advice for you know parents out there. Well, <clears throat> you hit on a really important point. Um, there's pastors that don't want to uh, ever exert weakness. Chuck was a little bit in that bag, you know. You never heard. I heard Jack Hayford talk about almost being tempted by his secretary and he had to fire her because he had yeah. bad thoughts. Yep. But Chuck never ever really talked about that stuff. Mm. And I think that as a, translating that into the area of being a parent, um, my kids have seen me fail. Yeah. In fact, when I look back on my parenting, because I was an absentee father, mm. I'll tell you. Two quick things about that. I was flying in, in my height of my popularity. I was probably gone at least 250 to 270 days of the year. So when the kids were a little older and I wasn't traveling so much, I, I asked them each individually once. I said, do so you perceive that I was gone more than I was home, mm-hmm. home as much as I was gone, or home more than I was gone? 
And they all said, it seemed like you were home more than I was. you were gone, because here's what we do. Mm. I would be in New York. I lived in California. And I'd say I did a, a, a weekend service, but I had another one on Wednesday night in New York. We'll call it, we'll call it New York, more than New York. So I would go home on Monday. I'd fly home to L.A., mm. be with my kids Monday night, Tuesday day, and fly out again on Wednesday to go do my Wednesday gig. Now, anybody else would have stayed in a hotel for two years. Yeah. So we swore to our own hurt. We, it was expensive, and uh, but yet that was – because to me, I'm a big believer in perceived reality. I deal with perceived reality. It's not what I really am like. It's what you think I'm like that I'm dealing with. You think I'm conceited. I don't, but I'm dealing with – I'm not that I'm not conceited. I'm dealing with that you think I am conceited. So I always, um, I always feel like you have to be really honest with your kids and, and admit your shortcomings because – if the, if you don't, then they have a different kind of viewpoint toward you, and it's not necessarily who you, uh, who you really are. So I kind of got off point a little bit here. I got to get myself back on. But what I, what I think it is is in our family. Uh, oh, uh, what I was going to say is that the legacy, the the thing that is the most um, satisfying to me about all four of my daughters who are not all walking with the Lord in the same degree. One's kind of almost not walking with the Lord. But you talk to the one that's not, and you say what you believe. None of my kids will ever say, you're wrong, Dad. They'll always say, Dad, I know you're right. I'm just not ready to make that step yet. You know, but I know that. So they know good doctrine, and especially now you see what Elisa's yeah, doing. Yep. Yeah. I couldn't dream that I have a kid that would have that much yeah. of a grasp of defending the faith. Yeah. So we've always been like that, and the great legacy, that, and largely due to my wonderful wife, who is unbending. You know, you see these couples go off on, on a, uh, a tangent with some doctrine like, oh, let's believe there's no hell, mm -hmm. and they're both on that page. I, if I said there's no hell, my wife would <laughs> just totally you, she slap you in hell. I, <laughs> yeah, she would, man. She, she, she had said to slap the hell out of you. She slapped the hell in. Yeah. Like, totally. Like, she, she just would not bend, yeah. and she doesn't bend. And so, a lot, right. largely because of her, her raising the kids, and me doing the best I can to be a good absentee father. That's the legacy that I'm the most proud of. That they all know real doctrine. Uh, the two oldest ones are totally locked in. My my daughter Cherie writes Spurgeon level mm. blogs that nobody reads on on Facebook, and I just go, man, why don't, she won't do a blog? I said, do a blog because things are too long. But they're so wise. And then my oldest daughter is a totally locked in Christian, and it's just awesome, you know, how the kids have turned out. And that I wouldn't care about anything else. I wouldn't care if they married well or were rich. That's to me the, the deposit that Amen. that counted. Can Amen. I? I want to. I want to ask you this, Chuck. Is that? I don't know if you, but I remember Ken Gullickson talking about this, and I kind of want to tie it to you, so I'm going to kind of do a chain here. But um, Ken said that during the Jesus movement times, that there would be like hundreds and 150 people waiting to just talk about Jesus off service days. Like just he said, we were working 14 hour days. Mm. Just there was so much need. And God was just like you said, explosive growth that was just the Holy Spirit. But he said it was just overwhelming to where he would talked about once kind of being dry because he was giving so much away that he didn't really have a lot of time to really have his personal, you know, to really spend time alone with God. And I remember they inferred that in the hippie pastor with um, with Lonnie that you remember his wife was saying, hey. Lonnie's having struggles and yeah. Chuck said, let's just get through this. And I don't know, you probably know more than me, but it just seems like sometimes when you're blessed as you were to be on the cutting edge of contemporary Christian music yeah. and you're so needed, so wanted, like you said, you're giving gigs away. People are usually you know, trying to do every gig. Yeah. You yeah. have so much. You're good. But did that maybe help? Uh, I don't know if you want to say that, but did that help maybe in your struggle with addiction because you're just so busy yeah. doing the work of the Lord that you sometimes, because I feel as a pastor, sometimes I'm so busy doing the work of the ministry, ministry. I forget the minister, I forget Jesus, I forget yeah. that I got to spend time with him, I got to know him, Intimacy. and I just, all I'm doing is studying to give, to give, but I'm not really having that one-on-one -on -one time. Did, can you say anything to that? I mean, because it seemed like... A little bit, a little bit. I'm, I, I think that you have a lot more um, responsibility than I do. I, I have always looked, because I travel in different churches, I come in... I never coast, don't get me wrong, but there are certain patterns that in my ministry that you do to our concert, you do certain songs people want to hear. 
and then it's done. So I don't have to do a big Bible study to do a service. You know, I just come in and I do what I do. If I, I, I was on past on staff for two years with Ken Gullickson in the church as a worship leader, and that was a whole different yeah, world. I had to bring it every you week. Go back to the road. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't but, fool those people. Yeah. You know, they knew when you were coasting. So, uh, but but I've always found the direct correlation, and I'm very um, relax in it. Uh, a lot of seasons in my life, if I am not taking the time to feed myself. It isn't so much that the ministry saps me, it's that I have to stay built up yeah. just to keep my even keel as a Christian. And uh, I have certain disciplines in my life that sometimes I, I do better than other times. But um, so what I do in the morning is important to me. Um, I, I'm really grateful for an iPhone. Mm. And, you know, you can dial up John Corson's uh, yeah. searchlight and get a daily devotion that's profound. I love it. You love John? I love, he's like my – I like love my, John's writing. Yeah, he's good. So good. Awesome, yeah. And I, I always say and, the reason I love John so much, when you can lose your yeah. wife and yeah. two children and still love Jesus, mm-hmm. Be joyful. that's real Christianity. I mean, yeah. I'm going – if I lost my wife, my wife's struggling yeah. with cancer right now, mm-hmm. I that cool. would – could you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not saying I'm following with Jesus, but you know what I mean? That would be yeah. – but he's so great. And we say, oh, you're in denial. And he goes, I've been in denial 30 years now, you know, because of – and people, he preached the funerals and did – you know yeah. what I mean? So he says, I didn't lose my daughter. I didn't lose my wife or son. I know exactly where they are, and I'm happy for them. Oh, you know, great. So you I mean, right? That's what I love about John in his laugh. Oh, 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 no. <laughs> he's kind of a Chuck, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chuck Jr. Sam. But anyway, so – Well, we went through that about almost two years now. We lost our 21-year-old grandson to oh, uh, fentanyl. So that that yeah, takes pain. you into a common experience, and interestingly, Ken Gullickson's grandson, uh, same thing. Mm. In the last few months, oh, wow. he lost his grandson about the same age, and um, uh, of course, Toby Mac yeah. 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 lost twenty-one-year-old grandson. So it's a common experience for all of us, and and I you don't know how you'd make it through it. In fact, I would tell people, I I'm not even going to tell you I can imagine what you're going yeah. through because I can't, yeah. but now I can. Yeah. And Greg Laurie, so Greg Laurie with his son, Greg Laurie. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah, so the, the, yeah, I agree with you about yeah. John. That's pretty, pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, he's cool. I love him. Um, but also, too, is like you said, you have a little more breathing room than maybe a pastor or Lonnie had, but that is because, remember, the hippie preacher was, that's what his wife who he's married to is saying because he had been molested, you know, he talked about it, and then he had, so, they, so a lot of people inferred he was just a, a fake the whole time but but what the inference i heard and i think ken said no he was sincere because ken mm-hmm. talked about the book coming out the t- three books but he says he's sincere he just got caught up in his old wow. lifestyle because he had struggled with that before christ and get and so that's like you said right it's really important because like you said we're not going to say oh i'm craig rotors i'm an alcoholic i've been three for 39 years and 42 days but to know humbly i have that propensity my flesh Likes to get mm-hmm. high, likes to get drunk, and so I need to flee, right? Mm-hmm. Flee youthful lust. I need to flee alcohol and yep. drugs because I, th- I don't know if you heard about the Calvary pastor. I can't remember where in California, but I remember Chuck saying this where he was a heroin addict and then he was totally delivered, miraculously had a church. I think it was like 3,000 people. Then he would have ministry mm-hmm. to people who were heroin addicts. Well, this guy gave him his kit. Mm-hmm. Well, instead of breaking it up, he put it in his dre- desk drawer. And then all of a sudden, a month, he just left it in there not thinking about it. And then a month later, he, he's going through a hard time. And he goes, I wonder what it would be like. And now, supposedly, yeah. he's a transient yes. on the very town that he was a pastor. So think, you know, so there should be a cry out to us. Don't ever, like you said, wherever a man thinks he's strong, sure. let him take heed lest he fall. That you're going, wow. You know, because the devil, right? I oh, mean, yeah. you know, I, I, John Wimber used to say it. I, I, you probably heard this. Higher levels, higher devils, especially <laughs> someone like yourself with the with the with the, the the worldwide notoriety if satan can attack you and get you to just fall mm-hmm. off yeah. that can affect so many people oh, yeah. and so we have to be aware of that with the right to whom much yeah. is given much, much is required. required so amen amen yeah. i always say that you go ahead um, oh no no i was just saying amen uh, i always thought that about you know billy graham or somebody you know the devil has he's going to be more interested in taking him down than he is me because if he can take that i always say the devil is a great spiritual warrior Hmm. he's not stupid he doesn't do stupid things he knows how he's patient and aversion is not a godly patience but he's willing to wait to trap you to push that button to get 
you know, it's amazing. That's going to be an amazing thing when we finally see how all that reveals out yeah. because yep, that to me is like genius. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he says it's, he's a sage Jesus because he thinks he's going to win. Yet he always has to ask God for permission. Yeah. Like, yeah. what does he think he's going to really break free from the leash? You know, well, like, he just wants as many right. people as he can. That's yeah. all he cares about. But uh, we right. know we've been going long, but yeah. we want to talk about your Thanks, book girl. really this quick. This is really great. I yeah. love it, man. Thank you, Chuck. Very encouraging. My pleasure. As, it's been like sitting in your living room. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. But we want to talk about your book, um, The Rock and Roll Preacher. So can you just mm-hmm. share, Thank like, you. when you wrote it just a little bit and – we encourage everyone to go out and purchase it, yeah. and um, we'll put that in the description below. So everyone, go purchase his book if you want more details on his testimony. But can you share a little bit about? Well, it? I'll, I'll do my little visual yes, here. Yes. Here's my book. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. You have it too, Jerry. Uh, well, here's the deal on this. I'm not that guy that writes his book, his life story. <laughs> but I felt compelled to the Lord. It was about 30 years ago that I started. I start. Just how far back it was on airplanes on yellow legal pads oh. with pencils. I didn't even have a computer at the time. And then when I finally did get a computer, I had a rough draft put into the computer, which I did myself, transcribed mm. it. But I, 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 I could never see the reason that God would have me write my story because I never, you know, there's more famous people. There's people that people are interested in. I wrote it kind of stream of consciousness. I take a subject like uh, my times with Brian Wilson, and I, I wasn't uh, here. Get a rumor started. I was never in the Beach Boys. I just worked with Brian Wilson on some projects, but but it was a great part of my life because I'm such a Beach Boy fan. Mm-hmm. But I take whatever subject it was, the hippie days, and I'd write stream of consciousness, whatever I could remember, mm-hmm. and then finally years later, when I got ready to do this, I I put it all together and assembled it, and I read it in in um, in uh, linear fashion and and i thought you know this is pretty interesting you've had a pretty interesting yeah. life but the main thing is always with us with my wife and i anybody in our family if we wanted it to be something that would touch people's lives in a, and get them saved yeah. whatever mm-hmm. or at least you know affirm them their christianity whatever have a spiritual effect i didn't just want it to be a story yeah. so we struggled very hard to put it together in a way that would produce that effect you know i tried to make my conversion experience i'm not a writer but to make it as uh, uh, emotional and connecting as possible. So when I got it all done, I felt good about it. And we, it took us, we actually, we kind of dropped it for a few years and I didn't do much on it. And then the last four years, my wife and I, she's really a better writer than I am. And we went through, we did most of everything ourselves. We had one woman go through it and, and uh, do a, a, a correction on it. You know, what do you call it? A, a proofread on it. Uh, but we did everything else ourselves, and we edited everything out. We were, we must have read it so many times. You know, it's the same thing making a record. You hear it so many yeah. times that by the time it comes out, you know, I don't ever yeah, want to yeah. hear it again. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So when we finally got it done, I found a publisher. I, I got rejected from most major publishers, mm. mainly because they'd say, well, bios don't sell unless you're really, really famous, mm. and I understood that. Mm. So they, they weren't interested to take it on because they're, they're profit-oriented. I, I don't fault that, but... I found this one guy who was more ministry oriented. He said, I know your story and I don't want to put it out no matter what. I don't care if we make money or not. So I made a deal with him and uh, we finally got it out. And then I'll tell you, when it was released, it was another moment of truth. I thought, I don't want this out. I'm a private person. Everybody's going to know everything about me. I don't want this. I went through about two weeks of that. Like, Can I take it back? Yeah. But now I'm comfortable with it, you know, and now we're trying to promote it as much as possible. And my, my, um, you know, my desire is that it'll minister to people. Everyone that's read it has told me it's interesting read. It's not boring. That's really cool when you're not a writer. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to me, it's a ministry. We pray over them and we want people's lives to be touched by them or it's not worth doing. That's my point. So um, I'll probably never, I may, I won't say never, but probably won't ever write another book. Yeah. But uh we're developing a script. I, one thing I do, well, we actually developed it. We've had it for about five years. We've had a script written off the book. And I think this would be a great movie. Oh, yeah. And I think we're kind of close to getting some financing right now. We have some things that transpired in the last actual week or two. So we're close to that. And then just to kind of wrap up the little bulletin here, uh, I'm doing an album first one in 30 years that in the studio I, I did a couple of worship cds in between but uh so that that's in the mixing stages and that new music should be out very quickly and then 
it's love song DVD. Um, it's too long a story to go in right now, but we're making a DVD uh, about the group that I also hope will have the same impact as what I hope my book will, that it won't just be a story of a band, but it'll show you what God did with some people that were in the right place at the right time. Just, it was all God, give God the glory. And uh, then, then coupled with that, it came out of a video that we did of a concert. There may be a, a DVD of that concert as well. So there's a lot of stuff coming out, That's a lot cool. of stuff to pray about. Yeah, it's a lot of money to raise. Yeah. And Chuck, we should. I would really like to have you. You have any more? Really have you since you kept you so long. But it was such a great time. But as to have you pray, because it's so funny when I saw you. I don't know how many years ago it was when you were here in Tucson with kind of the reunion tour or whatever with Chuck and everything. Well, how many years ago was, was that? Probably um, how many was that? Three or four or five? No, ten. Longer than that. Ten. Brother. Ten. Man, that's how, oh man, yeah, your time I'm, I'm 59 years old, and to me, like a year is like 10 years, man. Yeah, I would have I been think, in like middle. I thought it was like I thought it was like five years ago. I was in but middle anyway, school. so but it's weird how many of the Jesus movement, like still stuck in the Jesus movement, kept Christians there are. You know what I mean? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's like, and I liked how you said earlier. I don't know if it was off camera. We'll put it in, but it's how you said we need to not recreate the Jesus movement. But right, we need a fresh mm -hmm. move, right? Mm -hmm. We just want to say, I'm doing a new thing, right? Like, what are you doing? Like you said, where you have all these different subcultures, you know, you have the goth, you have the skinheads, you have the homosexual group, you have all these things. We yeah. need to move to the, uh, you know, where we need to touch all the groups and just say, God, you can do it and believe for that. And just really, because I think, you know, because Chuck, you know, had said that he really wanted to be used by God. I mean, I don't know if you know that in Tucson, he said he was so frustrated with the church here that he said he, he longed to be a fries or uh, I forget it was what I think it was fries manager Bashes. of a, of a, of a Bashes, a manager at a, a food store. He wanted to be out of ministry. And so yet yeah, look what God did, you Amen. know, so we, but I believe right. Chuck said, cause he was, you know, in college, he was supposed to be the man, you know, the most likely to succeed, but yet he had for 17 years, I think it was pretty, <laughs> a lot of failure or struggle, but that prepared him to be all, I think, to handle a great move. But can you pray for us that God sure. would just do a fresh new thing, right? And, you know, because uh, I'm 59, I feel like I'm, you know, I did so many drugs, sometimes I feel like I'm 80, but, you know, but it's like that we will have a fresh move of God again. Mm -hmm. And just like I said, mm -hmm. I, I love the Calvary paradigm. But I think sometimes we've forgotten our roots, that it really was a yeah. work of the Spirit. Amen. So if you could just, since Amen. you've been there, done that, if you could pray for yeah. us, yeah. that God would just do a real fresh new thing, but yet powerful like the Jesus movement. Father, I just thank you so much for this time. It has been like a little visit in a, their living room, and uh, I don't know where they're filming from actually, but it uh, looks pretty good. <laughs> And, uh, Father, I just lift up Mariah to you, first of all. Awesome. That uh, Do you guide the podcast, Mariah? Sorry. Mm -hmm. but, Kind of. I steal it from her, but she tries to guide oh, it. <laughs> I try, yeah. So I, I pray that you'll give her yes. wisdom and who to book and uh, just give her favor with great guests yes. and uh, let this podcast, I know their hearts, that they want what it, just as we do, whatever we do to minister to people. We don't want to, I didn't care about my story being out mm. other than you wanting it out, Lord. Mm. And I feel that from them. So I pray that you, you'll provide wonderful uh, production uh assistance in their in their podcast with great guests and and um, great conversation and great ministry and i pray for the church mm -hmm. and for pastor craig that you'll uh just keep the church on track yes. lord i know there's a lot of controversy right now in calvary with new path old path mm -hmm. but it sounds like their old path and that's the best path for me mm -hmm. and i thank you and i just pray that you'll uh just keep them uh, first of all that you'll add to the church daily yes, god. uh it, it always um saddens me when uh, uh, there's a, a sincere pastor out there that really wants to just preach the straight gospel and he can't get the big crowds because he's not doing the glamour and the glitz. And I just ask for you to bless his efforts, Lord, and add to the church daily, but also to give him the um, the, uh, the satisfaction of knowing that you add to the church. Yes. And no matter how big it is, it's your call. Mm -hmm. They're your sheep, not his. I'm not trying to preach to him, but I believe he knows that. Mm -hmm but just so that you would not be discouraged. Amen. And encourage them both, Lord, uh, put your hand of grace. Let this church be a beacon to the area, even in a greater way. Escalate the anointing in the church on the ministry. And I just pray for your favor and your blessing on the church and on their individual lives and individual ministry endeavors. 
And I just thank you. I believe you received that now in Jesus' yeah. name. Amen. Amen. Thank you Thanks, so man. much. We oh, encourage. Wow. That was sort of a that was sort of a preach. No, we loved it. No, that was like those were like words from the Lord, just like speaking to us and encouraging us and edifying. So prophecy, I guess. That yeah, even there you go. Too. So you said you move in it. You know. Yep. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. But um, we encourage everyone again to check out his book. That will be in the description below. And also you have a website, www.chuckgerard.com. Sorry. But we go in the description below. Check that out. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you'd like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. Please check out their website in the description below. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless.